Good evening. I'd like to welcome you once again to Central Park Neighborhood Church, where we're taking on the series of the life of Joseph, looking at the seasons of life and looking at the areas in our life where we go through things, experience things, and things that cause us to grow and mature in the things of God. And we left off our last lesson in the life of Jacob, the father's house, and We'll just review just a few of those thoughts as we continue on in our journey of growing in knowledge in the life of Joseph and applying it to our life so that we also can grow through our season, in our season, come out of our season, amen, rejoicing, knowing that we have grown, knowing that we have um, grown in our knowledge of God and grown in our abilities within ourselves to minister the things of God. So let's review once again the father's involvement in the life of Joseph and not only looking at it from the Bible's story and account of his involvement in Joseph's life, but let's consider it as our Heavenly Father involved in our own life. Let's begin with Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. We made the point that in the last session that in the father's house, the father loves his children. Our God loves us. You know, many times the enemy comes and he tries to tell us that God doesn't love us and that we aren't of any value and that we aren't any good and on and on and on. But the truth of the matter is, for God so loved the world, he gave. And because he loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. So he's loved us while we were yet sinners. He loved us. He brought us unto himself. And when he brought us unto himself and we were, our sin issue was taken care of, we just forever live in the love of God and experience the love of God. Many times uh, in the love of God, you know, he disciplines us and disciplines us. Many times uh, in the, that process, there are, it's, there's a pain level, there's a suffering. But every son whom he receives, he disciplines. It's the love of God being brought to us to change us and not to leave us immature, not to leave us uh, in situations that are that are not life-giving, but rather he comes to us and he works in us and challenges us, amen, and chastens us as a father. So the love of God, the love of God is something that I stated in the last message, the love of God many times can cause you uh, distress. And how, why that is is because you're loved by God, you're hated by the devil, the world doesn't love you, God loves you, and those other two, the world and the devil, he would like to do away with you, he would like to do anything he can to destroy you and cause you not to walk with God. So the love of God basically is reached out to you. It's It's came in Joseph's life in and under the life of his father. The second thing that we looked at was the fact that Joseph was given a coat of many colors. It's He's given a place of distinction, distinction among his own brethren. Whenever God comes to a person, you, my, myself, uh, anyone you know who comes to God, uh, each to each person, to each one of us, he gives us something of himself, something of himself to minister, something of himself that brings di distinction to each life. So no one is left out, each person. Each life is given, because of his love, a place of distinction and a place of ministry. Second thing, third thing that we looked at is the fact that in the Father's house he had two dreams. And in these two dreams, we will open the scriptures and we'll, we'll find that in Genesis chapter 37, we find that the dreams that came, uh, he told them unto his family. Let's, let's read the scripture. Genesis chapter 37. Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it to his brethren. He told it to his brethren and they hated him yet more for his dreams. 
He said to them, Here I pray you the dream which I have dreamed. So now he begins to lay out the dream. And behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaf stood around about, and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? They understood this dream that they were being shared with them. They hated him yet more for his dreams. And then it says this, and for his words. Joseph made some additions to what God was saying. Probably some things of maybe a little bit of pride, maybe a little bit of things, a little jab here, a little jab there. God has spoken to me. God has given me something and you don't have anything. And it didn't it didn't bring peace in the situation. It brought more hate and it brought more ill will between the brothers. He dreamed yet another dream. What didn't what one wasn't good enough. He has two now, okay? He tells it to his brethren, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And because behold the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. He told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father did what? He rebuked him. Okay? Then he said, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I, thy mother, and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to the earth? His brothers now, they envy this fact that he'd been given a dream. But the Bible says his father observed the saying. This father observed the saying. And we've, we've discovered that this word observed is talking about to hedge in with thorns. It's talking about protection. The father, in the father's house, uh, when he gives you a vision, he gives you purpose and dream, he hedges it about to, to bring it to pass. You see, God's word, uh, He does. He, however his word comes, it can come in a dream, it can come uh, several different ways, but in this particular fashion, it came in a dream. It was the word of God. And God's word does not return to him void, but how he sends it and what he sends it for, it returns to him, amen, fulfilled. So the word that God gives to each one of us, it has the power within itself to fulfill itself. Amen. The word that God gives you will carry you. And as you move along in obedience, it will carry you to the destination and the purpose that God has sent his word to you. And uh, so take, take heart with that today. Take heart with that today. When God gives you a word, amen, it will be fulfilled. So he observed the same. And from then, we, we talked a little bit about... Uh, his brethren were some distance away feeding the sheep, and his father wanted to send Joseph uh, to, to his brethren to find out how they were doing so that he could bring back a report to the father. And so we find that uh, his father sent him, sent him. And God, your father, sends you to do his bidding, sends you to do his work, sends you and equips you Amen, to do the work that he's called you to do. Whatever that purpose is that he's given you, there'll be ascending, there'll be a come a time. Descending, it might just be to your neighbor. It might be to somebody in the church. It might be to somebody in the community. It might be uh, any any number of things. It can be, uh, don't, uh, don't put boundaries upon the sendings of God. Let the Spirit of God lead you. Let him guide you. Let him uh, lead you to the places that he wants people's lives to be ministered to. So he, he was sent. Sometimes that's into danger's way. And when we, we know the story of Joseph, we know it yeah, as we look at that part of the story, well, it wasn't a positive thing for him. And it, it was something that really took him to the next uh, place and the next season of his life. And it was not easy. Sometimes the sendings of God are not easy. But in the sendings of God, there is grace, there is purpose, and there will be ultimately fulfillment in those things. All right, so he sent him. He dreams the dreams. His brothers hated him. And then uh, after that, his, we see the brethren then are, they are out taking care of the sheep. It's interesting to me is, why wasn't Joseph out there taking care of the sheep? Many times it's the younger that's sent out to take care of the sheep. David was the youngest of his brethren, and he was the one that was out taking care of the sheep. It was the younger's job. But once again, he had that place, his father kept him close, okay? And it caused him a great dif difficulty because of that. So his father now sends him to Shechem. And this place is literally means uh, the neck between the shoulders. It's the place of burdens. It's uh, literally to load up on the back. And so we find that there's the sending of the father 
that Joseph, he was sent by his father, sent to a place and to begin to take on responsibility. That is the, the heart of the father to you today is not for you just to be inactive, not to be take on responsibility, but take on responsibility, amen, for the purpose that God has for you. As we continue on in this, in this story, we find that uh, in the Father's house there's something else that takes place. There will become a separation between those with purpose and those who are lacking in purpose. There comes a separation, a separation. In the Father's house, decisions are made that uh, set your life, that set your life. Decisions are made. Every day you make decisions. We, we'll talk about those in a, in a later session. But now we come to a place of separation. And this separation comes uh, as Joseph is sent by his father. And he's wandering in the fields and he asks direction uh, concerning his brethren. Where are they? Because he didn't know. And uh, this is what it says. And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, they are departed hence. I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. So... The word Dothan here now is, is a place of defining decisions. It's a place of defining decisions. Dothan was a place of two wells. One well was uh, a well with a lot of water. It was a, a well that was well desired. The other well was a dry pit, a dry well. And so it's a place, it's automatically, we begin to see it's a place of one of... A dry pit and one is a well of living water and so here we begin to see that two decisions two places are given and the decisions will begin to be made in this place one decision uh, I want to just say this one decision if you was to wind up in the in the dry well it would be a place uh, where there is confinement there would be a place where your decision, if you wound up in this situation, there would be no fruitfulness. There would no be no uh, purpose in it other than it's just dry and I'm confined in it. And many times when we make decisions uh, that we find ourselves in a dry place, uh, we find ourselves uh, in a situation that really is, it doesn't do us any good. But then the other one is a, a well of living water, fresh water springing up within it to, and when we make good decisions, uh, they should refresh us. They should, uh, amen, move us along and cause us to, to be fruitful in what we are trying to do. And so here we find now that Joseph comes to Dothan. He comes to his brethren. And what, does his, what do the brethren do? They put him in the well of confinement. They put him into the well uh, that really had no water in it. This was, should have been a time when they should have refreshed him. They should have given him a drink of living water from that well. And they did not. It was a decision on their part at that particular point. So this is a place now where many decisions are taking place. And in the father's house, Joseph's brother set a plan of action to destroy his dreams. And part of the decision-making process here was his brothers wanted to kill him. In Genesis 37, 18, when they saw him afar off, he's coming to them now. Uh, even before he came near unto them, they conspired. Here they are. They are conspiring against him to slay him. They wanted to take him out. They said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. This wasn't uh, just one of the brothers' decision. They were talking among themselves. They were all involved in this decision-making. In verse 20, Come now, therefore, and let us slay him. Let us slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. They made another decision. They made another decision to, to lie. Decisions are being made. Now Reuben, being the firstborn, he did not want to see this young man destroyed, and he cooked up a little plan himself, and he wanted to deliver them out of their hands. So he says to his, to his brothers, he says, now let's, let's not kill him. He said, let's not shed uh, his blood, but let's cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but let's not lay our hand upon him. And the reason he did that was that he might rid out of their hands uh, this man, young man's life, and the purpose was to deliver him back to the Father. And so we see lots of decisions made. Another thing, the decision that was made, is that they stripped Joseph of his coat. What they were saying to Joseph is, why don't you just be normal? 
Why don't you just be like us? Why do you think you have this special place? You're not older than us. You don't have, this place doesn't belong to you. And they stripped him of his, his coat of many colors. Just be like us. Just be normal. You know, when distinction is removed from us, it brings confinement and stagnation to creativity in life. And so, you know, they wanted to strip him. They wanted to strip this whole uh, creative thing that God had given him. Many times that's what the enemy and circumstances would like to do in your life. Uh, don't let it take your, your distinction. Don't let it take your creativity. Push forward, push forward, push forward in the things of God. In the Father's house, one must learn to refresh his brothers, you know. Not take away his distinction, not take away uh, that creativity, but refresh him and encourage him. It's what they should have done, but their decision, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to put you in a place uh, of, of confinement. We're going to put you in a place where you're going to be stifled and we'll see. We will see what will happen with your with your with your dream and vision and purpose. Why don't you just be like us? How many of you have ever heard people say that to individuals? To maybe even to yourself when you've shared something. Why don't you just why don't you just settle down and just just be like us and just be normal? God hasn't called us to be normal. God has called us to be individuals. God has called us to be, amen, super saints, if I can say that, abounding in the grace of God, abounding in purpose, abounding in the very things that he has for us. Then we come to another point here. The brothers are, you know, they're talking among themselves, and then they're, they're, they're planning. They're, what are we, now we've got him in the pit. We've taken his coat, and... And uh, as we lead, read in the scriptures, he's calling out to them. His, his soul is in anguish, uh, but they weren't listening to him. And then Judah now, he, he rises up, and in Genesis 37, 26 through 30, we find that Judah rises up, and he puts the final stamp, make, puts the final uh, proposal here uh, to bring the final decision of what was going to happen to him. So Judah... Judah makes this, he makes this final appeal, and this is what he says. Judah said to his brethren in Genesis 37, 26, What profit, uh-oh, here's a new word, profit. He's talking about money now. Uh-oh, what profit is if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Now we've moved from, you know, killing him. We've moved from, you know, what are we going to do with him? Well, let's make some money off of this deal that we're going to do here. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And the, the guys, man, we're content with that. Let's just make a little few bucks on it, and let's go from there. And then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen. They drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit. They sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. And Re Reuben now, he returns to the pit. He doesn't find Joseph there. He rents his clothes. You know, he thought his plan was going to return him to his father, was going to rescue him, but it didn't happen to be. And I, I'm sure that he, being the firstborn, he thought, oh my, I have to give an account for this. What am I going to do? And, and on and on and on. Others' decisions affected his life, affected what he had to also put up with. So he returned unto his brethren and said, the child is not. And whether, where am I going to go? Where, how am I going to get out of this? What, what am I going to do? Well, it's because of the brethren's decisions to sell him and send him off to another place that caused even Reuben uh, consternation in this. Now we come uh, to the point where they have to report to the father and uh, they, bring, uh, they bring Joseph's coat of many colors along and they present it to him. And let's find out what the scriptures say in Genesis 37, 31 to 35. They took Joseph's coat and killed the coat of the goats and dipped it the coat in the blood. They sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found, know now whether it be thy son's coat or not. Of course he knew it. And he said, It is my son's coat. Now notice this. It says, An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. It doesn't say that the brothers told him what happened. It doesn't say that they went ahead and put an explanation to, 
took place. No, Jacob, he's the one that came up with, this is what must have happened. This is what happened. An evil beast, because it was tore, it was bloody. An evil beast has got him, and he's, he, he's, he's undoubtedly been torn to shreds and eaten by some wild beast. Jacob rends his clothes, puts sackcloth upon his loins, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted, and he said, For I will go down into my grave for my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Jacob had drawn his own conclusions, and the kids didn't say anything different. They let, they let I'll say it this way, they let the old man think what he wanted to think, and it, it got them off of the hook. They had to concoct a lie. That was a decision that they had to make and to bring a, a conclusion to the fathers that he could derive what took place with my son. And so we find that in the land of Dothan, it is the place of decisions. It is a place uh, that uh, were life-changing decisions. And Joseph's life definitely took a turn here because from here, he's taken by the Ishmaelites and he's sold into Potiphar. And we will, we will come to that uh, place in the, the next section or two. But today, we as the people of God, we're faced with decisions on a continual basis. And decisions, it's amazing how many decisions we actually make every day. In one of my thought processes, I, I put a little test together for myself, and I'll share that with you. I took a conscious effort of when I made a decision to get out of bed, go through my morning, get my breakfast, get out the door, and go to the job that I was going. I'd like you to just take a, in your own thought process right now, how many decisions you think it takes you to get out of bed and get out the door and uh, go to your job in the morning. Um, how many decisions do you think it takes? Well, in my, in my process of what I went through, I found that in that morning hour, I made individual decisions, the number of 126 decisions. Wow. We make thousands and thousands of decisions every day. And each one of these decisions that we make, uh, there's levels of decisions. There's decisions that become learned habit. In other words, uh, when I got out of bed and I, I put my shoes on, I didn't think about how to tie my shoes. I learned, I had learned earlier in life how to tie them. I just made the decisions, put my shoes on. I didn't think about it. I tied them up and I, and I was on my way. So those are kind of unlearned decisions. There's decisions that uh, they're on a different level than that. They require some thought. They require some effort put into them. Uh, for example, I know it's, it's, it's July. I'm going to call this decision uh, the decision of making decisions for Christmas in July. If you have to buy some gifts in July for Christmas and you're, you're thinking about family members, you go to the store and you, you look at things to try and get an idea. You look at things to try and get something that clicks. Maybe even before you went, you sat down and you made a list. What, what's going on here? This decision requires energy. It requires thought. It requires something of you in order to go and accomplish what you want to do. So decision-making process can require energy. It can require uh, thought from you. That's a different level of decision-making than just something that is a, a learned habit that becomes a decision that you really don't think about. The other area of decision-making is are those decisions uh, in life that are life-changing decisions. Um, maybe you're going to change a job. Maybe you're going to move. Uh, maybe you're going to get married. And, and these kinds of things require much energy, require much thought, require... Uh, a great deal of energy to be poured forth from your life. Well, that's, that's part of the, the, the energy and the life that is given out to make decisions. You know, there are principles that we need to learn to govern our lives by, and we need to make decisions by. And as we continue on, we will look at those decision, decision process, and we'll learn from it and grow from it. So today, if you're in the process of making decisions on whatever level they are, amen, amen. Listen, follow God, follow Him, learn to make good decisions and not decisions based on 
uh, lies, not decisions based on uh, things that are not true, not based on things that hurt people and cause consternation, but, uh, amen, learn to make decisions that are life-giving, amen, and bring refreshment to your soul and not things that bring confinement, amen, and stifle the very creativity that God has given you. Amen. The Lord bless you.